In addition to coal, oil, and natural gas, there are two other forms from which uh, two other forms of fossil fuels from which energy can be extracted. The first one is called oil sands or tar sands. The second is called shale oil. Now, oil sands are not sands at the surface of the earth. They are in the ground beneath boreal forests, beneath those coniferous cold weather forests. So in order to reach those oil sands, the forest is taken down. And that's, of course, a double whammy of adding more, um, adding fewer, having fewer trees to take up CO2 and adding more CO2 to the atmosphere by burning of these fossil fuels. And in the United States, 10% of our um, oil supply actually comes from this. And in addition to the issue with strip mining the boreal forests, there's the issue of transporting this thick, sludgy oil sand material from Canada through pipelines to Mexico, where it is then refined. So at any point in time, there could be an issue with the pipeline that is transporting it. And second of all, other than the American jobs for constructing the pipelines, um, it's not advantageous to the United States. It's not like Canada is bringing it to the United States for us to, uh, our citizens, to do the refining. It's, it's typically brought to Canada. A second type of fossil fuel, other than what we have other, already mentioned, is shale oil. And that's shown in the picture to the right here. And that's when oil is trapped in layers in certain rocks. So this is similar to where you would um, shake that rock to get the natural gas to rise up, only in this case, it's the oil itself, not a gas that's trapped in these rocks. And it could be purified. 70% of the res known reserves for these are in Colorado, Wyoming, and Utah. But there's a tremendous amount of water pollution, as you can imagine, from extracting this um, type of oil. And there's a very low net energy yield. You can imagine how much energy it takes to extract the oil from this rock to produce a refined version of it. So um, it's possible, but it's probably not going to be a serious addition to or, or a big addition to our um, energy needs. Okay, so next we enter a very important uh, topic that will be part of your open response. And that's the fact that fossil fuels are finite resources. And even though our per person energy use has leveled off somewhat in the United States, we still have increasing populations and more energy demanding devices. And globally, even more increasing populations and more energy demanding devices continues to um, make this fi these finite resources um, come closer to the time when we're going to run out. So there was a geophysicist who worked for Shell Oil Company, and his name was Hubbard, his last name. And he developed a curve that showed the point at which world oil production would reach a maximum, and the point where we will run out of oil. So let's take a look at the graph and what it says. So here along the axis we have time, and going up here we have oil production. So you can see over time there will be increased oil extraction, and then reach a peak point, and then over time the oil extractions would continue to be less and less. So there are two estimates. The orange line represents the upper estimate of what reserves of oil there, there are globally, and the blue um, line represents the lower estimate of the reserves. And as you can see, the time isn't specified, though he did on his actual graph, but the if there's a lower amount of oil truly available, then it will run, it will reach its peak production just slightly before the point in time where there are um, large amounts of reserves. And during that short period of time,
whether we have a lot of oil available that could be extracted or a lower amount, the amount starts to decline and decline. So why would the amount of oil being extracted decline after this maximum point is reached? Well, it's an economic matter. Once we've reached um, a certain amount, maybe halfway through our oil reserves, then it's going to become more expensive. And as it becomes more expensive, people will find ways to use less or to find alternative energy sources. And so then the, the, the amount extracted goes down. And in the end, whether we have a large amount of oil out there in the world or a small amount of oil, we still run out at the same time. So we have to consider the future of fossil fuel use. So these are estimates that have changed over time, and you don't need to memorize the numbers, but just take a look and think about what it means. The estimated conventional oil supply will last less than 40 more years. The estimated coal supply is quite a bit longer, 200 to 250 years. But let's go back and look at that. 40 years is a relatively short period of time. Back when Hubbard came up with his um, graph here, he actually assigned times, which turned out to be um, incorrect. He thought that we would reach peak oil production and it would start to decline much earlier than it has because it hasn't reached peak yet. Um, but the basic concept that he developed is still true. 40 years is not a long time. Uh, even 200 to 250 years is not a long time in a society, in a civilization. So if you look back at how the United States was 200 years ago, let's say, you can imagine the 200 years into the future, we would need to have developed some alternative energy sources before we need to start developing, developing them now. So issues include domestic production where we can get more oil in particular by drilling offshore and oil companies have already been given the um, permission to drill offshore even in New England though that has not happened yet um, but that's a serious um, future event that may come in during your lifetime for sure and Alaska, which I've already mentioned, um, and the wildlife refuge, and the issue of getting more oil, extracting more oil from Alaska. So what are some of the other options? Okay, we're going to take a look at nuclear energy, but first I need to do a little recap here. So remember from chapter way long ago, matter is something that has mass and occupies space. Mass is the amount of matter an object contains. It's not the same as weight. So the mass of a bowling ball on Earth is the same as the mass of a bowling ball on the moon. But because of gravitational pull, the bowling ball will weigh more on Earth than it does on the moon. Okay, matter consists of atoms. That's the smallest unit at which matter exists, and that consists of three main subunits, a nucleus which contains protons and neutrons, protons positively charged, neutrons no neutral, and electrons negative. Most of the mass of the atom is in the nucleus, so it's the protons plus the neutrons. Electrons are very tiny particles that are in orbit surrounding the nucleus and contribute very little mass. So an atomic number is the number of protons because that is what determines what the element is. So if a particular atom has six protons, it is carbon. It's always carbon. If it has six protons, it's carbon. It's not oxygen and it never will be. So that's the atomic number. And the mass number, because the greatest amount of mass is in the, 
nucleus here, the mass number is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons, or the mass of the protons plus the mass of the neutrons. And sometimes um, an element may have a varied number of neutrons than it would normally. So in the case of carbon here, there's carbon-12, which contains six protons and six neutrons. There's also carbon-14. So since it's still carbon, it has to contain six protons. The extra two neutrons, so it has eight neutrons, make it carbon-14 when you add six plus eight. And so carbon-14 is an isotope of carbon-12, which most carbon is carbon-12. Okay. Now we're going to take a moment to look at natural radioactivity or natural radioactive decay. So certain elements that have very large, unstable uh, nucleus to them, so a lot of protons and even more neutrons, can be, um, are unstable and can spontaneously release and do spontaneously release material from the nucleus. And when it does, you always get the same two daughter elements. So in the case of uranium-238, when it undergoes radioactive decay, you get helium and thorium. You don't get gold and silver, so you always follow a certain path in its decay. In addition to the two new elements that you have, the daughters, then you also have a certain amount of energy released, as you can understand from this, I hope. So let's see. Now we're going to look at nuclear energy, which is not the natural radioactive decay, but it has some similarities. Nuclear reactors take advantage of a reaction called a fission reaction. It's a nuclear reaction in which a neutron strikes a large, unstable atomic nucleus, which then ha causes it to split into two or more parts. So here you have your uranium, in this case uranium-235, and a neutron is blasted at it and increases the rate at which it breaks down. So it breaks down into two other elements called fission fragments, and as a result, energy is released and neutrons are flying around, so that energy causing the neutrons to move then bombards into another um, atom of uranium. And this series of reactions continues to occur and occur and occur and produce more energy. So what are the issues here with this type of energy source? So one of the advantages of nuclear energy is that it contains more energy than other things such as fossil fuels. For example, uranium-235 contains two to three million times the energy of one gram of coal. I'm sorry, one gram of uranium-235 contains two to three million times the amount of energy that one gram, which is a very small quantity of coal, um, contains. So that's, that's huge. Um, secondly, um, let's look at some of the disadvantages. So one disadvantage is that the daughter pop part, da daughter elements or fission fragments that are a result of this fission in the nuclear reactor can res or does result in other elements which are still radioactive, and yet they may not be able to produce enough energy to be used in a nuclear reaction, uh, in a nuclear reactor, but they still contain a tremendous amount of energy, harmful energy that can um, harm the environment and certainly human health. Okay, now let's take a look at how a nuclear reactor is constructed. So first, there is a concrete structure, a containment structure, and within that there is a uh, 
a section where the rods containing uranium 